So we're uh, doing an intro for Clint Lagerberg. Lagerberg. Why, why is it so hard to say? Lager. Because you think there's an L and there's no L. Lager. Lager. Like a lager. I like a like lager. A dark lager. Oh, lager. Lager. Lager, like beer. Lagerberg. No, beer is lager. No, that's somebody that cuts down trees. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. This is Kevin with Hunt Nashville. Uh, we are very excited to bring you this conversation we had with clint lagerberg <laughs> you still did it wrong lagerberg lager lagerberg all right this is gonna take a while all right what's up y'all it's kevin weaver with hunt nashville and we are gonna bring to you a conversation we had with clint lagerberg he's a good buddy of ours we actually met clint through carrie barlow mm-hmm which is actually how we make, meet a lot of the songwriter buddies. Am I right? Carrie's kind of like the center. He's like the Kevin Bacon of Nashville. Like 12 degrees of Barlow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Someone knows Barlow if they've been, if they've wrote a song. If you're anybody, you know who Carrie Barlow is. Yeah. But more importantly, who Clint Lackberg is. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is about Clint. We're Come talking on. about two different people. I know. Well, if you're anybody, you know what, Man, who Clint have you is seen as well. Carrie's beard lately? Man, he's got that beard. I haven't. Is, it's pretty. Okay. It's, it's hard to see to on Clint. text. We're back to Clint here. <laughs> okay. okay. Clint's got an amazing beard, too. He does? I don't know. Oh. He does. He wears. He's an open carry guy. I like that about Is he really? I yeah, know we that. were. We walked into a uh, convenience store, and I looked, he was in full camo, uh-huh. and he had blaze orange, and he had his holster on the outside of his blaze, really? blaze orange That's jacket. That's a man's man right there. I, I had to I had to <laughs> document it. It was awesome. It was really Did cool. you get the cold sweats? Yeah, I was like, man, that is, that's next level right there. That's that open carry. That's open. We're talking blaze orange, holster. It's embracing bag. the inner redneck. That's right. I love it. And you're going to love this conversation we had with Clint Lagerberg. Clint has written songs, I mean, with everybody in town. His latest hit that he had was Blue Ain't Your Color. Uh-huh. I mean, that's pretty amazing. With Mr. Stephen Lee Olson and Mrs. Hillary Lindsay. That's right. Another connection to Carrie Barlow. It is. <laughs> and that's Keith Urban's hit, of course. Right. But, I mean, he's had songs with Rascal Flatts, Josh Kelly. I mean, I could read this whole list right right here, but I'm just not very good at reading. <laughs> In general, <laughs> you're more of a speaker than you are a reader. Understandable. Uh, <laughs> all right, I'm just going to read them off. Okay. Are you going to read all Where of them Where I off? Draw the Line, Clay Aiken. There only, you go. Only the World, Mendisa. Uh-huh. Hey, I said that one right. Yeah. Come on. Mendisa is a, a CCM artist. She's a powerhouse. Mm-hmm. Military Man by Jesse James. Oh, that's Jesse James da- uh, Dacker, I think. Oh, yes, yeah. the female Jesse James. Yes, yes, exactly. Jesse James Dacker, then we you're got, correct. Uh, Get in the Boat by Neil Morris. Are you going to read his I'm entire gonna, disc- I'm read discography? We're talking While he does that in the background, I'm going to turn him down and say, if you like this podcast and want to hear more like it, make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening to on. Give us a rating. It would be awesome if you decided to drop a five-star rating. I'm turning your mic way down so I can get he this out. He wrote the Happy Birthday song. <laughs> you know that song Happy Birthday? Happy you, birthday. Make sure you follow us on that. Facebook. It's uh at Hunt Na- or it's at Na- Hunt Nashville on Facebook. The wheels on the bus go around. At Hunt Nashville on Instagram. Um <laughs> Double Trouble Hunting on YouTube and Kev Weave on Instagram. Mary had a little lamb. You can Hello. find him on his mic still way down. Um and at the J Wo show for me if you want to follow me for some reason. That's a private account. I have to approve you though. There was a Maryland man. Very song private. Right? Oh, it's and, called the, uh, the Hunter People. Thank y'all for listening. And you got anything else you want to say, Kevin? No, actually, okay. In real talk now, Clint, he was. It's an awesome conversation, yes. and we uh, we love hunting with Clint. Got to hunt with him. Finally, got him out in the woods. That's right. This Deer past hunting. season, uh, we didn't shoot anything, but uh, <laughs> we That's had a good time. How this always, we're always super excited. We're like, yeah, dude, we got him out in the woods. We didn't see a damn thing. Yeah, but, um, but man, it was a, it was a good hang. We rode some four wheelers. Uh, we had some snacks. Yeah, I was watching the video jealous from where I was at. Yep. So, I anyway, don't remember I... getting that text. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might, yeah, there's only so many stands in the woods, my, my friend. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I see. And, uh, I don't remember that. Dove hunt's coming up in September. You're, you're on the short list. I'll say that. I'm pretty, I'm 6'3". <laughs> Sorry. Dad jokes. <laughs> All right. Mm. You got anything else you need to say or are you going to go through a list of songs he didn't write again? <laughs>
<laughs> what what was the big hit from uh, Rascal Flats? That was the biggest. I don't know. Well, you got the phone in your hand. I can't remember. I, mean, I only know him as Clint. I don't know him as his accomplishments. I only know him as just a great man. Well, I feel like sometimes when we intro someone, you know, we don't tell their accomplishments enough, and we're just like shooting a bull about hunting, and no one knows what they actually did. You know what I mean? And he, you know, he is a, he has is written a, some things. He has. He is. And a I'm beautiful... not like just make like taking it lightly. It's yeah. It's his whole story was really. I would Here say. Here comes goodbye. There it is. Here comes Clint. Clint. <laughs> I'm gonna say goodbye, and y'all enjoy this conversation with Clint Lockerbie. So you're stuck in the woods, you're freaking out, yeah. and we had technical difficulties. And go. Yeah. Yes. Jared's yeah. here now. Yeah, this hey, is Jared. Time warp. <laughs> yeah. And back to the story. So I come out. <laughs> There I was. <laughs> <laughs> Sasquatch on his shoulders. Um, I came out to the corner of a field, and uh, there was a house with a light on it. And you can probably listen to me. We don't. Are we going to edit this? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you how to. That was the pastor. Okay, so yeah. So I, go, I come out of the edge, of, and there's like a house like way across the field. Um, and no one's home, like four or five different houses. The only house where someone was home was the pastor of this tiny little church in this tiny town and he brought me in his wife gave me soup hot soup and they called this was like i guess it was kind of before cell phones so i'm kind of dating myself here but um (laughs) they called my parents and uh and then drove me back to my house but it was it was such a and you can listen later but it was uh it was pretty traumatic like not that it it made me not want to go out in the woods again but Definitely uh, made me want to make sure I had more than one compass. My compass was <laughs> was screwed up, but yeah. But we were just talking about the fact that you know being in in Nashville and and you get you can you know get swept away and you know I say yes to a lot of stuff. I might be a little bit of a workaholic, but um, mm-hmm. uh, so my wife says about me too. <laughs> and I don't know. I mean, it, it it is work. There's a lot of work involved, but it's still kind of fun. But um, finding time to go hunting is so tricky like i haven't except for one pheasant hunt uh with barlow and catino Mm -hmm. i haven't been hunting in 12 years we're gonna have to change that oh yeah that's gonna change dude. oh boy (laughs) it's like season do you are so you're i'm ready what's that bow hunt at all i don't okay well i want to change that (laughs) oh Jerry's selling no he just sold his crossbow oh yeah yeah, he might have an extra did he sell the crossbow i think he got rid of it oh wow he he upgraded to a nicer model i think did he really (laughs) man the one he had was great yeah it was i remember when he got it the uh yeah we'll have to change that oh yeah man for sure sure. i live 15 minutes from here so we'll we'll get together i got some spots around here that would be amazing and chris dowdy um like he had he's i mean everybody's like inviting me to either go on a turkey hunt or whatever and then something will come up that i have to go and do so right but i think it's just like i gotta i gotta say no at, at right. least more during hunting season. Right. Well, especially yeah. like in this business, like in the music industry, where I, I view a lot of it from the outside now because I'm pretty much just a contractor now. I'm a recovering musician. <laughs> but the, uh, like, you you get so in that mindset of like, if I don't say no, somebody else is going to do it sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, so in like, a way. I need to take this track on or I need to do that right because this could come out of it. So yeah. I can understand like, and then you're like, all of a sudden your plate's full and all the stuff you, not that you don't enjoy your job, but yeah. it still is a job. It's still it work. Is. Totally. And what you have to think about it, if I don't go hunting, someone else is going to take Should that. That's yeah. right. That's <laughs> right. You gotta change I mindset. know. I know. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not setting up game cameras because I, you know. Oh, oh yeah. we go. No, that's what you need to do. You yeah. need to throw some trail cameras out somewhere. Just See what so I'm you, missing. You go yeah. looking like, oh my gosh, there's a 160 inch whitetail. Right. Uh, <laughs> get, Crockett. Getting back to your getting lost story. Yeah. Uh, that happened to me too, dude. I don't know, kidding. I mean, I was, I think I was like 22. And it was the same thing, and it seems it seems like it happens when you, you get with, together with another guy, and you're like, "All right, dude, you go this way, I'll go this way. We'll meet back." And yeah. you don't really talk about what you're gonna do, mm-hmm. and it's easy to get turned around. And I'd been hunting for I'd been hunting for five years before yeah. that, and like grew up in the woods, mm-hmm. you know, the whole thing. And each like ravine looks like the next one. Yeah, when you're mm-hmm. out in the hardwoods and that kind of thing. And I mean. Luckily, I which here's a tip that I 
I had read in like an old field and screen, stream magazine or something, if you're ever lost, find a, a fence line. Oh, yeah. And follow it. No yeah. matter if it's like Civil War fence line, yep. you know, rock mm-hmm. wall, just follow that fence line. It'll mm-hmm. eventually, eventually lead you to an opening. Yeah. And I did that, and I was I was lost for an hour. But, I, man, your heart gets oh, going. Dude, like, it's like, I mean, you do panic. You've lost like that, right? I never, like, when I was a kid, so we... Our, when we lived in South Mississippi, we backed up to about 500 acres. Oh boy! And uh, it was different. It was different when we were kids. I don't yeah. know if you grew up near the woods or not, but yeah, like, I, I took a. T- I was 12 and I took a 20 gauge out and I'd be gone for 10 hours. Yeah, on that, Saturday, and my parents yeah. were like, "Come back, that was shoot yourself." That was my life too. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. I just take off walking, and I did get lost a couple times when I was a kid like that, just like walking around. Luckily, it was the kind of loss where. It was all surrounded by stuff, so eventually I'd find my way out. Sure. But even if there's like five minutes where you're like, "Oh crap!" Where, yeah. Which which direction did I come from? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it can your heart just starts racing. You're yeah, so I'm I never can, gonna make it home. Right. I can imagine that, that eight to twelve hours. You're it out. was oh, it was really yeah. and there were like you reminded me when you said the field and stream tip. Um, I did think of two things that they taught us in hunter's uh, safety mm-hmm. when I was I don't know eight, and I was eighteen at the time when this mm-hmm. happened. Um, that either just stay still and blow your whistle or whatever just you know and i did that i remember okay well yeah i gotta stay still so i sat on the stump and i'm just like you know (laughs) blowing this whistle and and after a while like okay no one is coming to find me (laughs) and then the next thing was like okay if i come across a stream i'm just gonna i'm gonna it was it might have been my own tip that i made in my mind i'm gonna follow this is gonna go to the ocean (laughs) Because I was, you know, we were near the ocean too. Yeah. So, but um, did that lead you to something? That or? actually led me to the edge of the field. That's uh, awesome. Okay. So it which, actually did work. It yeah. did work. Well, which yeah. people generally build close to creeks out in the country. So, that's yes. it's actually not a terrible. T- yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, and, and downstream for some reason made sense. Just follow it downstream. But <laughs> yeah, but that was that was my last hunting experience in New England. Right. Um, and then just life gets crazy. End up working and. You had I mentioned no. Uh, you mentioned you were you met your wife around that that time. No, or met my wife. So what ended up happening? So around that time, yeah. Um, I was just working. Like the mentality in my hometown was, you graduate from high school and you either go to the gun factory, Thompson Center Arms, or you mm. go to the shoe factory. And I went to the gun factory. Oh. I worked at Thompson Center for a while and just bounced around from factory job to factory job and just did the thing and. Mm-hmm. Um, that all my brothers did and uh not a lot of kids from my graduating class went to college uh it was just kind of the mentality there but uh so i got a lot of that life under my belt and that all serves you know for later down the road to have a well to draw from to right. write songs but uh uh did you start music around this time as well yeah i i, I at the time i i started playing guitar at 12 okay. and so I just that consumed my life oh, like yeah. you know eight to ten hours a day mm-hmm. you know grew a mullet out and just, <laughs> the whole thing that's right yeah. who introduced you to play guitar my dad okay so oh, there was always okay. a guitar in a house he played in a um like elks lodges and vfws like a like a cover band country cover band and um so there was always <clears throat> pretty cool gear in the house so when it came time it was there and i was surrounded by it so it was it was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, guitars and guns yeah, was, man. was, was my cool. life. That's, your dad sounds like a badass. I'll oh, say that. He, he said he was he giving them, uh, <laughs> guns at six years old and beer at eight. Well, no, actually, <laughs> my first beer was at six, almost seven. Oh, really? Oh, really? I'll tell you. I'll, all right, here's that story. So like, we're out summertime, hot. Not but New England doesn't get super hot anyway, but um, mm. we're out there and we, there were five boys. There were no girls except for my poor mom. <laughs> um, and he worked us. He, he had his Ponderosa and his, you know, Bonanza TV show right, right there. <laughs> and we were, uh, we'd dig ditches, we'd haul brush, we'd do whatever. But it was the day that we were digging this massive hole in the backyard to get to the cover of, I think, I don't know what it was, the leech yeah. field or something, but it was deep. I don't. I, I remember thinking even that young, like, why is this down to the ground so far? <laughs> Seven and, tank or something. Yeah, yeah, it was really deep. Um, so we did that. Uh, we did some other hard work in the sun, and I remember my dad yelling in to my mother, hey, Linda, put some ponies in the freezer. And I had no, <laughs> no idea what that was. <laughs> so we're like, okay, we finished work, and we come in, and there's 
Miller ponies <laughs> <laughs> laid out on the counter. The cover cracked off almost to slushy form. Uh, and, all right. and we're all looking at each other like, is this really going to happen? And we took a sip, and it was the most amazing, refreshing, cold thing in the world. But then, after like a few sips, you're, you know, six years old. Um, at the time, if this, if I was six and saying this, they'd come and get my dad. Yeah, but, right. Yeah. But uh, it was amazing, and then it started to taste like dog pee. But uh, uh, <laughs> and I switched, yeah. switched. The cool like, layers yeah, off. Yeah, the yeah. They're like, you're like this, Dad. But there yeah. was that kind of just thrill of like, I'm a man, like, oh, like yeah. my dad for a minute, you know. And you, mm. you worked like a man that day, and so it was like this reverse psychology right. we were talking about earlier, and and the whole thing with buy me a gun early too is same kind of thing, right. just to you know get just the respect right away. There. What was your first beer? Oh, I was I was older. I I didn't really drink in high school. I had I went to a couple parties that right. But I was pretty. I was always worried about driving because I love yeah. to drive so much. Yeah. And I was just like, if I would lose my license or anything like that. Yeah. I was so freaked out by that. Yeah. And uh-huh. and also, you know, we've come from a very conservative uh-huh. household, I and way. I would we did too. My parents, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, you you would. Right. It was it was conservative. I mean, it was you know we went to church. We yeah you know, we did a lot of. But yeah, it was just I, awesome. it was my dad's mentality because he grew up with um, eight boys. Uh, no girls and they were he started smoking at six. Oh no wow. five i'm sorry and he would go and you know uh in his one room school and in the basement was the bathroom and he would steal a bunch of cigarette butts from his <laughs> wow. father and go down yeah. and the rest of them. and go down in the bathroom in this like uh, uh retired furnace thing and go down and smoke wow awesome. it's like wow <laughs> Whole whole nother time, whole nother generation. Yeah, I, a different time. I yeah. know. And, and do you have boys or girls now? I have two boys and one girl. Jack okay. Jack is four, Eli's eight, and Abigail is fourteen. And so that that all sounds just crazy to give your kid. A <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> they're they're like, like I'm, I'm not condoning. <laughs> no, a I would never do right, that, people. Yeah. Like but, never. But but it is interesting that you were able to grow up and having a healthy respect for yeah. this. Uh, I guess that just comes down to your relationship with your dad. Yeah. And be having a fear, healthy fear of him. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure a that very was... healthy fear. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, we yeah. definitely got whooped. The, uh, <laughs> my mom wouldn't let my dad. So we, like, grew up in, like, our, the county that I'm from is still dry. Mm-hmm. So, oh, wow. So we, we grew up in a very conservative place in South Mississippi. Mm-hmm. My dad got a job. Uh, he's a contractor as well. He got a job in, in D.C., so we moved up to Maryland for five years. Oh, wow. And um, when I was, like, five or six and I remember my mom wouldn't let him drink but she would let him buy O'Doul's so <laughs> O'Doul's he had an O'Doul's one night and they were laying he was laying on the couch I remember very vividly watching TV and he let me have a sip of it and like it was that same thing like oh this is cool and mm-hmm. then I was like oh this is disgusting, this is disgusting. <laughs> like, it's, it's the that, worst thing yeah. I've ever had it's that feeling when your dad lets you steer you know uh-huh. or lets oh, you yeah. sits you in the lap like, oh this is fun oh, oh shit yeah yeah exactly <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Big old goofy smile. All right. Yeah. It was. There's a lot of wild stories like that. But well, yeah. What? Um. So you started playing guitar when you were 12. Mm-hmm. When did you? I mean, every musician that started playing with their kid understands that obsession of like playing. If you're not doing schoolwork or doing something you have to do, you're playing. You yeah. Know, whatever instrument, whether it be drums or guitar or whatever. Sure. What uh, was there a moment where you started to decide like I want to be in a band or I want to start doing my own stuff or did it just kind of come naturally with friends? It was uh, it's it's kind of twofold. Uh, my dad listened to listened to a lot of records and eight track sets. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, eight track out in the garage when he was working on a car or something. But I was you know always listening to great music uh, from. Herb Alpert, you know, oh, the Tijuana yeah. Brass, wow. Chet Atkins, The Ventures, um, wow. you name it, like a lot of great old stuff and like old country. Um, and it was, I remember it was Halloween and uh, I was, this was before I actually started playing guitar. There was always instruments in the house and I have all my makeup on in, in my Halloween costume. My brother's a werewolf, and we're going to go out <laughs> trick-or-treating. at. The, uh-huh. We're going to start at the uh, the Lilac Mall and do the whole you know <laughs> indoor all thing right. and then to the trailer park next door <laughs> and uh, go there. And um, so before uh, we're going to go, we're waiting on my brother to finish up. 
I'm like, okay, I got some time. And I put on these big, goofy headphones, and I took my dad's old Microfrets guitar. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're incredible. Look them up. Um, cool. And uh, I put in a Chet Atkins 8-track. And I, for some reason, had one in my closet. Uh and I remember my dad saying, that's one guy playing those parts, the rhythm, the bass, the lead, all at once. Mm-hmm. And I, it was hard for me to fathom because my dad was like a you know core guy, a little bit of lead, but just sang in this band. And so I'm clunking through the tracks. I'm like, no way. So I grab the guitar and I'm pretending I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. And it really almost felt, I got to a point where it felt like I was actually doing it. Right. And I was so taken by that I didn't go trick-or-treating that night I stayed home <laughs> wow. and just pretended to be Chet Atkins wow. like for the whole night so later uh, I took my parents to see Chet Atkins at the Portsmouth Music Hall in New Hampshire and I got to tell Chet that story oh, wow. which, which yeah, was cool. shortly before he died um, which was really cool but then um, uh, later in life uh, one of my older brother's friends brought over a cassette of this guitar player from Sweden and I'm, I'm Swedish named Ingve Malmsteen, mm-hmm. and it was like this neoclassical heavy metal, super fast stuff, mm-hmm. and that was it. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm Swedish, and I love that. I got to be able to do that, so I grew, <laughs> grew my hair out, at least in the back, you know. <laughs> we got to have the party soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, maybe I'll find a picture for you guys to oh, post Yeah, let's up. post that. Please oh, do. it's <laughs> so embarrassing, but... Um, and I did. I, my dad ended up, uh, we grew up very, very modest. Um, and he was saving up for this uh, 12-string acoustic. He had always wanted one. He found the one he wanted. And, um, but right around that time is when he knew I needed more than what he had right. for uh-huh. gear. And so he bought me and my brother um, Fender Strats. Oh, wow. and, I, and mine was a 1987 Japanese Fender uh, 57 reissue, which oh, now are like, Oh yeah, you know, they're like they're like four grand, Dang. you know. Oh, but at the time, cool. he ended up getting two strats and a little gorilla practice amp, <laughs> and and then I begged him for a, a distortion box, a boss. <laughs> yeah, it was it was probably the yeah, oh, it was a Digitech, I think. Right. And um, <laughs> so I just went to town. I got tablets or books and whatever I could get my hand on, and um, my hand because I only have one. Just kidding, my hands. Um, but, uh, and that's the story. <laughs> and that's the story. Yeah. I, 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 no. Um, but yeah, so that was that was it. So I just, I shut myself in my room. Like, I got skinny, pale, and long hair. And I would even bring my guitar to school to um, in study halls. Anytime I had a minute, I'd be playing guitar. Right. Just consumed by it. And and that, it for some reason, was almost like, osmosis or something growing up in it and hearing it and my dad would practice in the basement with uh his band and i'd always be around that hot glowing tube smell and, right. and the, oh, yeah. everything smelled like stale smoke because they played in the, the w's dust off the tube. Mm. yeah it was just <laughs> something man that should be a cologne it should yeah. you know and and so that was there so when it came time it was almost like it just happened like yeah. it, it happened really quick um and at the same time, uh, my dad had a friend, Ray Gaudet, um, who would play guitar with uh, Roy Clark whenever oh, wow. he came to New England. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was incredible. And right when I started playing guitar, he gave me a four-track reel to reel uh, and asked me, or told me, he's like, I need you to record as much as you can anytime you feel like you're getting to a place where you're doing something you like. Mm-hmm. So I did that, and I have tons of tapes and I've converted them you know I remember converting them to VHS tape and uh, just to keep them but um, so when did did you start writing lyrics at this point no this is just this all is instrumentals all, all instrumental. it's all sounding like Top Gun you oh, know yeah. and and speed classical guitar and um, I bought a little bo- uh, Boss DR550 drum machine mm-hmm. and started a multi-track right when I started playing guitar and his whole purpose for, for this I found out later was that um, he wanted me to externalize and so to hear myself outside of myself because when you're playing you think it's great but it when all you, sounds good yeah but when you hear it back like, oh that's yeah. sloppy that's <laughs> and so like I just oh. such a blessing to have that so early um, someone to have that wisdom to you know to kind of fine tune yeah. right so to beginning. really think about parts yeah, yeah. Like early on because you don't yeah. really think about that well coming at it from a different 
different aspect too, because at least in in this town, most everybody starts off as a songwriter and then moves into production out of necessity because mm-hmm. they get tired of paying for demos or they yeah. don't have a publishing company that will pay for their demos or whatever. Mm-hmm. But to start off essentially doing production, I mean, you're recording and and creating instrumentals, but not starting off writing songs. Yeah, it's really interesting. I you don't hear that very often from somebody starting on that end of things. Yeah, and it was it was just all kind of, uh, and again, I, I grew up on a on a dirt road, and they still live on that dirt road about a mile up. It's gravel, hmm. um, and uh, so yeah, little little dude in a in his bedroom with a four track reel to reel, which mm-hmm. really, I mean, uh, there was. I remember growing. We did have a uh, just a stereo uh, uh, reel to reel. Just you know, every house kind of had one back then for whatever. But uh, to have the multi track thing was pretty cool. Uh, I learned how to bounce and actually get more more than four tracks. And then I ended up involving the VCR mm-hmm. to bounce stuff to that, and then you know the four tracks I got here, and then uh, you know the, the ping ponging, ping ponging, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and play and, along with what you did and splicing and, it yeah. was like, and yeah, you know, cool. so and this was before internet, right. um, so you're having to figure all this stuff out yourself, and and this man Ray got it help too, but uh, so that's where it all started, um, and then for the next, I would say five or six years that's all I did and you know still working hunted. factory jobs off and on or this no this doing? is like from like 12 to okay I got you. this is before this is like yeah, yeah. Uh, kid to through high school right and um, did a lot of like talent shows and all that stuff and um, I ended up doing this one talent show where I arranged this CPE Bach piece called Solfeggietto for like heavy metal oh, and wow. and did the, at this time I, I've graduated from the tw- four track reel to reel to like a cassette multi-track mm-hmm. eight track mm-hmm. so I had more tracks it can make it sound even worse mm-hmm. um, <laughs> uh, and I made this backing track for this piece and ended up playing it uh, and I ended up winning that it was like like this huge New England talent show thing and it was a senior year in high school and Barbara London from, I don't know if she's still alive or at Berkeley in Boston, she was in the audience and she came up to me after. She's like, what are you doing when you graduate? I'm like, well, I think I'm going to go to Thompson Center Arms <laughs> like my brothers did. And she's right. like, no, you're not. You're going to come and see me. Like, I'm like, we can't afford college. Yeah, right. It was just, you know, it was very uh, different. Yeah. Um, she's like, no, you need to talk to me. We're, we're going to figure this out. I'll we'll work it out right. and I never did it oh, oh really I never did it and and the thing is but I, I'm thankful I didn't because we we probably wouldn't be sitting here like yeah. a whole nother path probably would have happened yeah. and who knows where maybe we would have been sitting here but well, we um, might have been sitting in your house in an island somewhere. Right. No, I'm just yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. We might have been hanging out with Jeez. all of our friends. Yeah. <laughs> okay. well, no. what? So, Dude, I never went to college either. It was just like here. each path, you don't know. You're Well, I think it's like when you come from a working class family, yeah. it's kind of like when you're out of out of out of high school you're like oh, I gotta make money yeah. get a house yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and like you yeah. start working young too. you know I mean I thought yeah. I uh, our family toured and I say toured well we played probably 200 shows a year for a couple of years playing churches up and down the east coast wow my, me and my sisters and my dad and my mom sold merch and prayed in the middle of it I had so, no idea dude so we did that for several years and that's kind of was the catalyst that brought us to Nashville but when, so I was homeschooled all through from like sixth grade. Our kids are homeschooled. Yeah, yeah. And, and I loved it. Yeah. But when I was fifteen, I kind of like sat down with my parents. And I'm like, well, I mean, they're going to be a contractor, which is our my sure. My dad's a contractor. My grandfather was a carpenter. My great grandfather was a carpenter. Mm-hmm. And, and I enjoy it. I'm either going to do that or I'm going to be a musician. Mm-hmm. And so, what do I need to go to school for? I was like, yeah. can I just go ahead and graduate? Yeah. And they're like, all right. So I took my GED when I was fifteen. Mm-hmm. And I quit going to school and I worked started working full time. Holy cow! So I've been working. 40 or 50 hours a week <laughs> for the last, for a oh, long time, for the last 17 yeah. years. So and you then, need hunting. Yeah, <laughs> right? so, but yeah. so like I got a jump start on things and I don't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that route for everyone or even sure. most people, but like, I don't think it's fair to pressure 
I, I think I don't think it's fair to say you need to go to school in order to do what you do. You need to figure out what you want to do. I agree. You don't need to go pay fifty grand to find out what you want to do. That's you can, right. You can do that. And then if That's you're right. like, you know what, I want to be a marine biologist, then yes, you need to go. That's to right. Six years of school. Mm-hmm. You need to go do that. Mm-hmm. But like, if you're going to come out of school and be like, I want to be a manager at a restaurant, or I want to own, be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Well, you may need a business degree, or you may not need to go at all. You might just get out and find out in the field. That's right. And like some real life lessons that you get paid to do. Okay. I tell you what, I think the the dirt road university that I went to is the best school mm-hmm. I, I personally could have ever right. had mm-hmm. to serve me now. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm so thankful for it. But again, yeah, like with our kids, my daughter's 14. She's super talented, gifted singer. Uh, she, she has a little a logic rig that I set it up for. <laughs> she's, she's playing around now and great piano player. Um, and but our whole thing is like, you know, you can mm-hmm. if you want to, but we're not going to pressure it. We're yeah. not that family. My wife comes from a very um, collegiate family. That's South minus. You know, so but even that, she's you know she understands, and I think mm-hmm. maybe after being with me for a while and seeing my family and seeing how, right. you know, she realizes that Abigail has the the same music bug that I have. So. Yeah. You know, and we all know the industry's changing too. It's like, do I want my daughter? I know. Yeah. In oh, that, I know. You know? Yeah, and that's yeah. I think of that as well. I you mean, know. I think I remember the pressure when you're like a, a junior in high school. Try, there's a, like this big put. You have to figure out what you're going to do with the rest mm-hmm. of your life. Mm-hmm. And like, I had a no junior idea. In high school? You know, like seventeen. I'm still I, developing. I'm still like, waiting for so whiskers. I, what I'm going to do? And like now? Yeah. And like, and so it. I knew I wanted to play drums, yeah. you know, yeah. and I, I was good with my hands, mm-hmm. so I, I, you know, I knew I was gonna you know, work like like you or yeah. my dad or some kind of trade, and uh, that's how I fell into the plumbing yeah. and stuff. But but it is that is a big that's a big pressure for kids at eighteen years old. Yeah, like it, I yeah. don't think you're not ready. To well, your 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 like your frontal lobe doesn't develop till you're twenty six. Uh-huh. Like you're not making like you're not ready. You're not ready. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, you know as much as. Young kids don't want to hear that. I mean, and uh, there are a lot of mature kids that yeah. may, you know, I don't know how they figured it out, but, you know, they may be on the path that they're supposed to be on, but a lot of them aren't. And and I think uh, I think uh, it's different for everybody. But, mm-hmm. yeah, um, it, and that's the, that's the other thing, too. Like, to have that time to really um, punch that clock and, and develop that other language... Um, I didn't write my first song with lyrics uh, until, gosh, maybe I was 25. Really? And it was, this is, this is funny. Um, so I'm, I just met my now wife, and uh, she went to college in New Hampshire, University of New Hampshire. She's from Philadelphia. Um, so she grew up with a love for New England and vacation in Maine every summer with her family. And um, here's this dirt road boy, no college degree, long hair. Well, I didn't have long hair at the time, but uh, uh, musician. Uh, yeah, you know, right. And she's from a collegiate family in Philadelphia and and falls in love with me. And, and um, I had written this song at the time. I could not stand to hear myself... Uh, like on, you know, a voice message. I just couldn't stand, like I was uh-huh. sick of, it was feeling so predictable. Like I know what I'm going to do here. And, you know, I was just tired of it. So I'm like, okay, I got this, this new keyboard, all these new sounds. I'm like, I'm going to record something uh, that is the polar opposite. I'm going to do the polar opposite of my instincts on every move from the beat to the bass, to the keys, to the whatever. Um, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to write something. And, and whatever I would normally want to say I'm going to say the exact opposite just so I can stand <laughs> listening to it right. it was just an experiment mm-hmm. and it was a it was a uh, I guess a faith-based song um, it was called so like sowing and reaping it was just kind of just a fun thing just mm. a play thing and uh, so fast forward a little bit my wife and I are married we are struggling uh, I'm working I'm now living in Philly I you know uh, moved out there to continue the pursuit and uh I'm working at Johnson and Johnson as a temp because I didn't have a college degree, so I, they couldn't hire me permanent. Oh wow! I'm a temp. Uh, you know, shortly after we get married, we have a baby. What were you doing over there? I was just building spreadsheets and oh, you know, right. and you know, office just management. Office work, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And and kind of watching, you know, the 
time that I would be able to put into music slowly disappeared. Mm-hmm. And I was still, you know, I still played guitar and still did it, but uh, just starting to make that transition and like, okay, I'm a husband and a father. I have to provide. And this right. is, you know, this isn't over this music thing, but I really got to, this mm-hmm. needs it all. And um, so we're struggling and uh, we get uh, a check in the mail from my brother for my birthday. It was $30 in a, on a, in a birthday card. And we're probably having a conversation at that time, like, so, okay, we're going to use some of this for groceries and some of this for gas. <laughs> well, uh-huh. And, you know, and it was a struggle, too, because my wife grew up not having to worry about finances right. at all, and, and I did. So I knew struggle. I knew. You were you, used to it. You get through it. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not scared at all. Mm-hmm. And, um, but she's like, no. At the same time, we also got this, um, I guess, a flyer or something from the John Lennon Songwriting Contest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the entry fee was thirty dollars. Oh wow! And she's like, you know what? We're gonna do that. You're gonna enter that song that I did um, into this songwriting contest. And I'm like, no way. I'm, you know, this is gas for the week, whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, but I did it. And long story short, it ended up winning the gospel category. Wow! And then it ended up winning the overall category. And the and the the judges were like Elton John and and I mean like really big dudes and man, and, that's awesome. So at that point, I'm like, man, maybe I should do some more of this, you know, and, and I tried and there's some, you know, pretty bad stuff that came out around that. Um, and then fast forward a little more, uh, prior to getting uh, married, like a week before our wedding, I got an accident. And in um, the state of Pennsylvania, if you get in an accident, um, if it's your fault, uh, the other or either way, you can sue the person at fault within two years right. and um you know i had i didn't know that but right. uh just about the two-year mark we get a knock on the door and it's christmas time and it's a police officer with a oh, lawsuit wow. we were oh, man. probably in a conversation like okay we have a we have a baby how are we going to do christmas yeah. um and then we get that and it was just such a kick in the gut like we were already down and oh, it was yeah. like okay <laughs> this Kicking is this is here. bad uh, so my wife gets up um to lay on the bed and she's crying and i'm i'm sitting on the couch and this table right here <laughs> uh the year the christmas before i saved up to buy her this pottery barn table she <laughs> loved and i i did it and uh and sitting on this table was a a pad and pen and I'm left sitting on the couch in this converted bull barn, one bedroom apartment where I had a little uh, multi-track rig in the loft above our bed with had like orange brown shag carpet and it was gross, <laughs> but, and you had to climb a ladder to get up to it. But, uh, I swear to you, I had nothing to do with this song. I, I just picked up, I was so mad at God. I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah. we're done. We're breaking up. Mm-hmm. This is it. I, yeah. I can't, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm just sitting there. I'm, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm like, I started doodling and then all of a sudden I heard a song in my head. It was so clear and so, uh, it was terrifying because like I couldn't put my finger on whether or not I'm just hearing a song that I heard that week or something. It was right. that clear. Like what the heck? So I started writing down every word and I heard the melody and, and kind of, um, I remembered that, wrote it all down. Uh, next morning, got up and recorded it, did a demo of it. And uh, at the time, I'm bouncing around from temp job to temp job, and my uh, one of the bosses I had and I was a bass guitar player in a guy's band named Dan Thomas. Um, and this is around September 11th. Okay. Uh, and uh, he was the, my boss was a bass guitar player in this guy's band. His name was Dan Thomas, and he was doing like a three song thing in New York. I'd never been in a real studio. Um, and, uh, they needed a guitar player for this and like, well, the guy's like, well, I just hired a guy who plays guitar. Let's see how he is. Mm -hmm. I went to the thing, got the, got the gig. And this was just at the time they were letting people kind of back in to New York and you could still smell the hot Mm. metal. It was really smelled like a foundry. I I worked in a foundry. Mm. So I knew that smell. Mm. And, um, and, but we're there, we're in the studio. It was such a cool experience, experience. And, um, uh, stayed friends with this dude, Dan, and anytime he'd like kind of drive in from Jersey to Philly to play at the Kyber or something, he'd stop in and just see if I had recorded an instrumental or something. Just he loved it. He just loved to come and listen. 
and I push play on this particular song. And this dude is like, you know, not really, you know, religious at all or anything. And he's there with like tears in his eyes. Mm. And I'm like, whoa. And then my mom and dad came out um, for Christmas and same thing happened. I had never seen my dad cry in my whole life. Wow. And I push play. I'm up in the loft and I look down and my dad is crying. And whoa. I was like, whoa. And the song was called For All You've Done. And and it was like, oh, cleanser of the mess I made. Upon the hill our places trade. Stretched on a cross. Your body crushed by wounded hands you formed from dust. It was like this modern hymn. Mm-hmm. And again, I just wrote it. like right. it, So I, I can't take any credit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, crazy. The dude, Dan Thomas, was engaged at the time to a man named Eric Nordhoff, Mm -hmm. who um, used to work at Word Entertainment in the International Distribution Department. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like, this could be a long shot, Clint. But my future brother-in-law was best friends with Eric Nordhoff in high school like 10 years ago. If I can reconnect them and see this is the only way that I... Someone needs to hear this. And he connected his future brother-in-law and Eric Nordhoff. <laughs> Eric Nordhoff agreed, yeah, I'll hear the song. So we mailed it to him oh, with wow. with like a like an inkjet um, printed uh, headshot that I made. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and sent that to him. Uh, and then he called me on my real goofy uh, flip cell phone um, <laughs> while I'm... In my cubicle at Johnson & Johnson, he's like, Clint, what are you doing right now? I'm like, I'm in a cubicle right, at yeah. Johnson & Johnson <laughs> um, making a spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. He's like, do you mind if I walk down the hall and play this for Cindy Wilt? And uh, Cindy was the VP of publishing at Word. I'm like, yeah. And I have no idea about the music industry. Like, right. nothing. Mm-hmm. She sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Here I am. Like, uh, so... He does. About a half hour later, she calls me and, you know, it's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm working full time at J&J and I also teach guitar full time. I was working two full time jobs and and um, and uh, she's like, can, when can you get down here? I'm like, to Nashville? <laughs> like, uh, I guess I can do this. So I, I ended up driving all the way to Nashville. Um, I forget what year it was, uh, and stayed at Eric Nordoff's house. He had no idea who I was, but just right. wonderful family. And um, uh, he took me around, and Cindy had asked me, uh, you know, you should, do you have anything else? And I, I played her some other stuff, and the cool thing about Cindy, she's since left us, um, died of cancer a couple of years ago, but... Um, she was super honest with me. She's like, this is so bad. This is, and, but she wouldn't just say that. She would tell me why and right. like kind of like put some notes. And so her challenge for me was like, all right, write me four songs a week. And even if they're bad, whatever, just keep sending me songs, right. mailing me songs. So yeah, I'm right. mailing yeah. her songs uh-huh. every week. And, and so over time, her critiques, you know, you know, uh, started to get better. And then, you know, uh, it got to the point where she's like, okay, um, what would it take for you to quit one of your jobs? I'm like, and you know, she was looking for a number. And in the Christian, mu- Christian music industry, um, the, the offers, the deals are pretty, you know. The number's low. The numbers, <laughs> yeah. the numbers yeah. are low. And, and I said the number, and, and I heard some silence. And she's like, okay, let me, uh, let me talk to Sherry Saba, the, the president. Mm-hmm. And um, again, I'm in a cubicle. Now, mind you, I had I'd been working at J&J at this point for probably like four years trying to get in permanent so I wouldn't have to pay health insurance and right. you know it was some of the benefits. yeah and yeah. and I'm in my last what would be my last temp position and I had been through the 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 uh situation where I'm in the job that's not permanent but then it goes permanent and they have to hire somebody else so I have to train this person how to do the job I've been doing for a year mm-hmm. and uh so I'm in the last one, and my boss comes to me. He's like, hey, man, uh, I, I know you heard, but your, your job's going permanent. You're going to have to train the dude. to get up to hire some people. I mean, uh, uh, interview some people. And uh, he's like, and you know, I can't hire you. You've been through this before. He's like, but it's your job. I'm hiring you. I've worked out some some stuff, da 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 And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, talk about. Yeah. I can finally really take care of my family. Yeah. 
And all the while, I have no idea what's going on in Nashville. And um, long story, as long as it takes <laughs> to tell, um, that song ended up getting into the wrong hands. Uh, it got in, actually, first Point of Grace, which is a Christian oh, yeah. band, they ended up hearing it and wanted to cut it. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Right. But I was excited. Great. Um, what's but, a hold? Yeah, what's right. a hold? <laughs> uh-huh. um, and so then... Uh, at that time, Point of Grace was at the top. Yeah, they, they were. They were the top were of a uh, Huge. And, and, yeah. and, but again, I didn't know. And so it got in the wrong hands at the same time, and I, I won't name any names, but the dude ended up putting it on this worship compilation CD that was sold at Walmart. It was a budget CD. My demo, like it wasn't even that great, wow. and oh. uh, me singing on it, and um, and so here I am starting out the beginning of what could be, you know, a big change uh, with a potential lawsuit, and it was I had advice coming from all over the place, and here I am in Philly. This is all going on in Nashville, and and then I get a call from Shelley from Point of Grace. And I'm like, um, like here I am, like what on earth <laughs> right. is going on? Yeah. And uh, she's like, Clint, we are so worried because we want to cut the song so bad, like, but it's almost now, to a point now where we can't with what's going on with it. And again, I got so mad at God again, like, mm-hmm. and, and you know, you know, um, they're like so close. Oh yeah, yeah. it's like and, really, and, like this really? is almost. And this has it's... been the story of my life. Yeah. Like this is, um, but. Uh, Ended up working it out, and I get pulled in uh, to the office uh, at this position I was in, and we're going through the the situation of you know how how we're going to work this out. So I'm going to get the job, and and it was just going to be great financially at that time, so good for us. And then two days later, I get a call uh, from Word Entertainment that they figured out how they can um, get me out of that job. And, oh, wow. and actually and give me what I asked for or what I said. Right. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Uh, what do I do? <laughs> like, right. yeah. you know, this is a completely unknown over here in Nashville. And then I got this, what I've been Steady. working on. Yeah. And uh, we talked about it. My wife and I were like, we got to do this. I don't know what it is, but we got to do a publishing deal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and so I had to go back in and tell my boss... After he's none, worked all this out for you. And none of them knew that I was a musician because you really have to keep that quiet. You can't right. kind of uh, let them know you have You're aspirations. That's right. <laughs> I'm the company man. Uh-huh. And then, it, I mean, the look on his face was, it was anger, then intrigue, and then excitement. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. And he, like, parades me around the office and, and awesome. like, did anybody have any idea? Da, da, da. Uh, that's, that's and anyway, cool. so... At least he took it that way. Yeah, it ended up being cool. And then so well. we spent about um, maybe... Eight months, uh, me kind of going back and forth to Nashville uh, and co-writing for the first time, and mm-hmm. and uh, uh, so yeah, I had the the deal. Uh, what set. happened with the song? So the song ended up getting cut. It yeah, did. yeah. All right, so, so you worked so, out the, the the whole lawsuit. It, it all worked out. Yeah, so uh, there was no lawsuit, and I, I didn't oh, okay. want to do that anyway. And yeah. um, the guy ended up taking the song off the CD, reprinting the CD, and putting it out. Okay. And um, so that was how it all started, um, uh, and I mean, really, there's so much more detail that I, I don't really get to think about a lot, and even talking right. about it now, yeah. it's just like, wow, so crazy how this is all yeah. happened. What led to the ne- yeah everything that had to happen to get it to line up, for and things. and yeah, it ain't so always weird. ain't always pretty, ain't always easy. It's like yeah. you know, it's gosh, there's so much. Um, there's so much. For lack of a better term, education in those moments too, like yeah. the, the ups and the like. You learn way more in the downs than you do the ups. The ups are awesome and yeah. it's fun to ride them. But like, I think of like even in anyone's career, no matter if you're like a nurse or a teacher or a musician or whatever, like yeah. the the downs teach you so much more mm-hmm. than the highs do. The mm-hmm. highs are awesome, <laughs> yeah. but it's like the downs really yeah. kind of mold you into who you're going to be that's you know? right that's that's where you're made and you kind of have to go through them you don't really have a choice like yeah. i don't want to talk to i don't want to hear the life story of someone who hasn't been through anything I know. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah and i want to hear the dude that's been like down yeah i worry about those people it. sometimes too just <laughs> yeah. like what happens when the when a, you know the shit hits a fan it's gonna fall out eventually oh i worry about them but like you know the hard knock kids um seem to kind of 
have it easier, yeah. even though it's hard. Like you, you're able to persevere through some things, and um, and I've definitely come to find out that you know as much as you try to fight it, struggle is so beautiful and mm-hmm. so necessary. Mm-hmm. It's it's it has to be in your life. Like yeah. there's no avoiding it, and. Um, it builds your faith so much too. Oh, like, totally. Your know, faith doesn't get built when you're handed everything and everything goes swimmingly. You know, mm-hmm. It gets built when you really have to lean back on. Yeah, and it fills a well. I mean, especially yeah. for what I'm doing now. But um, so I had that three year deal uh, with Word, and it was great. You know, uh, you know, a number one in in Christian. I can't remember what the breakdown is, but it, like it's pound for pound like a number. 40 or something in country, you know, <laughs> but still, yeah. but you know, it had a lot of action, you know, for, for that industry, it was, it was going really well. Um, but I monetarily, was, yes, but notoriety, I feel like you'd get a lot of exposure. Yeah. yeah. As oh, a yeah. writer. Yeah. It's a huge, it was yeah. great. So then, yeah. um, but I started to feel like, and you know, God bless the people that do that. Uh, you know, write Christian music every day. I personally started to feel like I was going to get struck by lightning. Like um, I'm trying to make a buck off Jesus or something. Like right. no, like I started to get to a point where my I really wanted to go somewhere else with the song, but every song had to be wrapped in a mm-hmm. hopeful bow, and at the end, and it just was like, no, this is like look at the old hymns. Mm-hmm. Those were born out of like those are the ones that slay me. Some of this stuff just makes me angry it's mm-hmm. just not real mm-hmm. and so I was really growing weary about being in that industry and um, and I was also touring with Nicole Nordeman right mm-hmm. when I got there uh, we needed uh, a certain amount of money on top of what we were making to, to make everything work and like a week after we got here I had a playing guitar for this one artist at this GMA thing downtown and Nicole was in the audience. She came up to me with her road manager after and asked if I would want to go on tour. Wow. And here I am like, I remember going to concerts and wishing they would pull me up on stage so I could... Right. Steam, you know. <laughs> Which if you're going to go on tour with a Christian artist, Nicole was a good uh, one to go she, on. She's so good. <laughs> she, I mean, just... Yeah, so I mean, I mean, she's a lifelong friend now, but like we had so many of the same thought processes of like just about songs and, and she's a brilliant songwriter mm-hmm. in fact she uh, really just wanted to be a songwriter in the beginning mm. and so I learned a lot from her and we wrote a bunch and, and got some more point of grace cuts together and <laughs> nice. you know and <laughs> and um, and then um, we uh, but having that too like what she was able to pay me was exactly what we needed just wow. it was just all this confirmation stuff that I was supposed to be doing this right. and um, uh, I was on a okay, so this is why I brought up Nicole because I was on a, a flight to a gig in Dallas with Nicole, and we had to uh, fly into St. Louis and then stay on the plane and then connect to Dallas and do the gig. And at this time, my deal at Word is coming up, and I'm thinking I don't want to resign, and, and uh, I got to figure something else. I at the time I had a couple flats holds, and I really wanted a Rascal Flats cut, like I, they were. I really wanted that to happen, and mm. uh, it was hard to get some outside stuff out of the Christian world. Mm. I got a Clay Aiken cut, mm-hmm. and a, um, a Phil Stacy, if you remember yeah. him. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was that kind of get bitten by the bug a little bit. I can write a song that doesn't have to be hopeful all the time, right. um, <laughs> and you know, there was a place for that too, I guess. But mm-hmm. uh, so. I'm on this flight. I go and I had a little too much to drink uh, mm-hmm. the uh, the night before having to fly out the next day. And I, I have like an 8 a.m. flight. I'm feeling really bad. Yeah. And I'm at the airport. Get on the Been plane. there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I ate flying out the hangar. Oh, oh, it was worse. worse. And actually, it was the first time I ever threw up on a flight in one of those bags. Oh, uh, I mean, they fill right up. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, what was so cool, the stewardess was so sweet. Like, I think they're trained to be like a mom at that moment because I felt so bad. And um, so she took that bag and, I, and another bag. And um, when we got to St. Louis to connect back to get to Nashville, I'm having that day of that flight, I'm having the meeting with Word to like, they're going to do whatever it takes to keep me because they kind of knew I was about to leave. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm on the plane. I got my earbuds in. And I thought I'm just supposed to stay on the plane because I did on the way out. 
And apparently I wasn't. And they did a head count and miscounted. Oh, wow. So it was this fluke. And we're flying. We're back in the air. And I'm like, okay, I'm feeling a little better. And, and it's not a far fright, flight from St. Louis to Nashville. And uh, I, I, a stewardess walked by. I'm like, hey, are we, are we going to be landing in Nashville anytime soon? I got a meeting at whatever, 2.30. Mm-hmm. And her mouth hit the floor. She's like, you got to go to Nashville? Uh-huh. And she runs back to the thing and like makes a call and like talks to it. And like another stewardess with her comes up and is like, this flight's going to Montana. Oh, man. <laughs> so I ended up, and I'd never been to Montana. It looked yeah. beautiful Both from the window. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So we, and so then at this point, it's like, you know, that feeling when you drive past an exit. Mm-hmm. And you know you get like the next one to turn around is like ten minutes, which is twenty minutes. After a while, it's just a joke, and you're mm-hmm. laughing about it. But I was really worried, and you can't make a you know I can't connect with them from the plane. So I end up Montana, and there was zero flights back to Nashville from Montana. No direct, nothing. So uh-huh. I ended up having to go from Montana to Sacramento, Sacramento to Phoenix, Phoenix to Dallas, Dallas to St. Louis, St. Louis <laughs> then Nashville. I left. Dallas that morning at eight and got back to Nashville at one a.m. By the when I got to Whoa. Montana, when I got to Montana, I was able to call um, the guys at Word and let them know what happened, and I wasn't gonna be able to make the meeting. But I think it was definitely a, a meant to be because I missed that meeting. The next day, I had a co-write uh, with Nicole Gallion, uh, my first like write with a uh, a country writer at Warner. Warner owned Word. Um, and we wrote a song, and it was she really loved it. And she was married to Rodney Clausen, and um, and I had no, no idea who Rodney was. And, <laughs> and so I am leaving that co-write. We did a little work tape, leaving that co-write, walking across the street to go to this meeting, mm. the final meeting. And I barely made it to Word, and she had sent the song to Rodney, and um, we had like Nicole and I had talked about that. I. Uh, I didn't want to sign this deal, I, you know. Mm-hmm. She, so Rodney calls me. Hey, Clint, it's Rodney. <laughs> Don't sign a thing. I got I got a meeting set up for you with um, Extreme Writers Group slash Big Loud Shirt. Yeah. And um, I'm like, okay. Oh no. How am I going to do this? So I, this, I, I, oh man. Well, I guess it was maybe nine years ago, okay. eight uh-huh. years ago, uh-huh. eight years ago actually. Um, and so I had to dodge as much as I could in that meeting and without saying yes to anything. Then I had the meeting with Big Loud and Extreme and it was great. I ended up signing there. Mm. And um, so all those years in Philadelphia making spreadsheets, my publisher, Michael Martin at the time, who knows at ASCAP, mm-hmm. is like, hey, um, flats are looking again. Uh, so that's your that's your goal this week. You know, write me some flat stuff. Mm-hmm. So I go home and I I have a, at this time we were living in Spring Hill. Uh, We lived in Bellevue when we first moved here. Mm -hmm. And then I I had built a studio in the bonus room across from the nursery. And, Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, I, I, I'm sitting there like, how am I going to do this? I really just want to nail this. And for some reason I got this idea, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to build a spreadsheet and I'm going to take in all the flats record titles up to now and put them in columns. I'm going to leave a blank column at the end, and I'm going to try to create a virtual record of titles for them just to get in, like, to start, like, profiling, I guess. Yeah. Like, because <laughs> all these songs over here got a yes, and we all know what that takes to get the yes. The Johnson & Johnson spreadsheet skills. Come on. Yeah, right? <laughs> See, it all is connected. This is some inside information right here. This is, like... Hey, this, level. this could this <laughs> getting could, a cut. <laughs> hey, this could really, and it's I still do it to this day. And wow. and if you know anybody listening, um, write songs, try this. So what you're doing is you're looking at a, a a picture of every song that made it through the hoops of Nashville, mm-hmm. and that got a yes in a no town, and yes. you know, and so. The not, same your book, sorry. The, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm I got a yes in a no town. <laughs> <laughs> and, sorry, you don't have But so, like, like, um, you know, not that I was trying to rewrite any of the titles. It was just get me into the spirit of what they say yes to mm-hmm. and what they like to say. Uh, and then every once in a while, I would listen to one of the songs and just kind of get in the mood. So I'd read across the titles. When I came to that blank cell, I would type in whatever came to mind, whether it was, I love white gravy you know <laughs> i would i would write it right. just to get the ball rolling right. 
And then eventually the first good one I got was, it was Here Comes Goodbye. Oh. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. So I put it in bold. And then I did some more. And at the time I had written um, a song with an American Idol artist. He was a Christian artist named Chris Sly. And that climbed the charts. Uh, I think it almost made number one. But um, he was coming over the next day to write. And I'm thinking, oh, we're going to write for his next album. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had written you know, the verse and part of the chorus. And... Then Chris came over the next day. I, I ended up writing Here Comes Goodbye. Hmm. And it was based off of um, a true event in my life, uh, living on the gravel road yeah. in Maine, and uh, in a breakup. And um, so Chris comes over. He's like, hey, dude, I don't want to write a Christian song. Let's, let's write a country song. I'm like, cool. I got this one that I started. And yeah. so he came up with that cool piano mm-hmm. intro, and, and we finished the song. And I turned it in, and at the same time, I wrote this other song that um, a band called 33 Miles, Jason Barton, is lead singer of that, uh, turned in that song and this song, Here Comes Goodbye. Mm-hmm. First two songs I turned in, and I'm not saying anything to you know, blow a douche trumpet. <laughs> um, it was just, it was like shocking, you know? Yeah. And that... Uh, so, But it was great coming in to a publisher and be like... Hey, here's two. Yeah, here's two. <laughs> so it ended up, ended up the the thirty three mile song. Uh, the, the it was called uh, "One Life to Love." That ends up getting cut and being a single. Then the flat song was cut and became a single and went to number one. Mm-hmm. And it was good and bad because then you think this is easy. This yeah, is how right, it goes. Right, 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 do Your this expectation again. is really high. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it, you know, so that was that was crazy, um, but. Um, and and I wrote with Craig Wiseman a lot. We got some uh, Blake Shelton stuff, bunch bunch of cuts with him. And and uh, but at the time, Big Loud and Extreme were breaking up, mm-hmm. and uh, and I have this hot iron that unfortunately, you know, I was so new in the country world, like I had zero connections. And I was really relying, you right. know, a little more than probably should on your publisher, and and uh, probably missed out on some you know, opportunities, but, uh, even that was great. Even that was a good thing because not that here comes goodbye was a fluke, but, uh, I don't think at that very moment I would have been ready, um, to kill it every right. time if I got into a, you know, a big, I mean, I did get into some, um, good rights, but, and I, it did good, but yeah, uh, eventually I probably would have burned out really bad. Right. Uh, and, you know, we live in Nashville. We see how a lot of relationships end. And, mm-hmm. you know, from just, I think it would have been so taxing on our lives for me to try to keep that up at that moment. So that was another just miracle that, you know, the that ball was dropped a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, ended up going from, uh, I went from there to, uh, just wanted to hang out by myself for a while, like figure some things out after I, uh, after they broke up, mm-hmm. um, they were kind enough to let me out of the deal a little early, and because uh, I, I wanted to, I just was just needing a change. Um, and Craig Wiseman is just—he's still a great friend. We still write, and he's yeah. was—he's taught me a lot. And um, so then I, I signed at Sony. Was there for a year, uh, and thinking I wanted to do the major publishing thing again, mm-hmm. and. Um, that wasn't the, a good fit for me, uh, and then I ended up going from there to an independent deal with an investor, and that was pretty cool. We did mm. a year and a half trial. We just wanted to see what it was like. It was really cool, um, but again, didn't have all the pieces it needed for it to be as successful as it could have been. Mm. Um, and then from there, uh, I went to Seagale. Right. That's where I am now. Yeah, yeah. 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 How was that first uh, Rascal Flats cut when when you saw it happening? Like, did it happen like that really quick, or was it like, oh, we want it, let's do that? Well, that that day I turned it in, um, Michael would always play it immediately, and he's turned around in his chair. All I see is the back of his chair and speakers, mm-hmm. and he didn't turn around after listening to it the first time, and then he played it again. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, oh, he hates this. Uh, yeah. You know, we're just starting to get to know each other. And I'm like, oh, no. He turns around, he's like, because I had said, like, man, I, 
think I did it. I think I did it. <laughs> and he, and he's that. thinking, he's thinking, oh man, I hope he doesn't think yeah, every hear, song he writes is. I hear that from every writer. Yeah, that walks yeah, in. yeah, yeah he's like, yeah, great. Yeah. I hope he doesn't think this is. Call the bank. <laughs> yeah. So he, uh, he's like, I'm gonna send this um, to their uh, one of their managers, and he did, and it got to their bus that night. And they put it on hold. Um, wow, that same night. Yeah, it was super fast. <laughs> so that fast. is really fast. And then you know, <laughs> in, in, in this industry, um, you know, the songs that come in early on records end up kind of being the old songs, and they end up liking the new, fresh, shiny right. toy. Um, yeah, because it's, it's a, it can be a two-year process. Yeah, to and, actually pick the record and everything. And they were smart. They spared me from a lot of the drama they knew was going around on around the song. Like, there were times where we're definitely cutting this. There were times where it was dropped and off hold and then back on hold I had no idea this was going on and then I'm writing I'm actually in a a co-write with uh, Nicole Gallion and and Dave Barnes uh, at the time and and Michael comes in he's like hey uh, Clint uh, can you come into the office and he was acting Hmm. playing really you know Mm -hmm. sad and disappointed (laughs) and I'm like oh no what's going on yeah Yeah. so I'm like oh no and and we go into the office and Jason Hauser's part of Extreme (laughs) too Good old Jason and he oh, um uh we're in the conference room and it was a conference call with Lyric Street and I'm thinking, you know, this is the call they're letting me know, hey, I know you were really excited about this, but it's over. <laughs> and um I'm blanking on his name, I feel so bad. Um uh he's like, Hey Clint, man, uh, you know, I know this has been dramatic and this is you know, you really wanted this to happen and Okay, so I'm like, okay, I'm I'm emotionally, I can take this now. <laughs> All right, yeah. And he's going go. through, the, yeah, right, he's going go through the spiel yeah. like like it's mm-hmm. not happening. And he's like, you know, I just want to let you know, dude, it's it's unfortunate, but they're you know, they cut it, and it's going to be their first singles. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I and and I didn't hear I didn't hear that. I'm like, what? Holy cow! <laughs> anyway, All right. I had like mm-hmm. that was just honestly like, you don't even know what to think because yeah. it was you know so. I mean, I'd had a lot of that in the Christian world, but this is a whole other world. Yeah. And and I didn't even really know what that meant. Like, you know, um, so I had to <laughs> leave that office and walk back to my co-write, and I couldn't even talk. Oh, yeah, like, and they're like, and go and like, write a new song. <laughs> they're like, what happened? Like, And they were really concerned. Yeah. I'm like, I just got Rascal Flatts' first single. <laughs> and they're just like, what? <laughs> like, I mean, this was, and we're all, you know, we're still, we were all pretty young into our deals. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was, it was, you know, unheard of and not to be expected. And um, so it was just, it was so cool. Uh, yeah. And again, you could, it was tricky to get back into the mindset that this isn't how it happens every time. Oh, yeah. Then, then you start to realize how much of a no town it is. And, you know, but, <laughs> That was cool, man. That's all. So that you felt like that at that point. That was a big shift that happened for yeah. your Nashville career. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I think. I think it was just like again. It was another point of confirmation. Like, okay, I, I really needed to make this change, mm-hmm. and um, and it, it definitely helped us out of a, a really uh, tricky time financially. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, so just from there, just went on to write more and more, and and get better you're always getting better like you're always finding holes in your craft and and trying to correct some things and um but yeah i what i'm realizing now i'm at a point in my uh career that i love co-writing but what got me into all this was a hundred percenter um that (laughs) actually god wrote so maybe i shouldn't do this but i (laughs) i have written at the time i did write a a bunch of hundred percenters that work too but like um, I really want to do that again, like just to kind of what what will I without anybody helping? Like, right. what can I do? You know, you look yeah. at like um, I don't know why Travis comes about Travis Meadows. Yeah, the first one's kind of mine. Just like just like an insanely phenomenally talented songwriter and storyteller, and he has been through some shit, which was, oh, yeah. makes him such a good songwriter. Mm-hmm. But like he just was like making records. Like, yeah, he wasn't doing the songwriting thing, and then all mm-hmm. of a sudden people start cutting his stuff. Yeah, just because he's so talented. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with just going into making a record that you want to make. And yeah, who knows? Yeah, and it, and it it, I guess you would almost have to treat it in a way like your record, even though I have no aspirations to be an artist. Right. Wow. Um, but yeah. you would almost just like because this 
of all the wisdom I have from Craig, one of the things that sticks out every time is we were in a co-write, Craig Wiseman, and I brought in this idea um, that was totally Kenny Chesney, and and I'm starting to feel like this is it. We're doing it. We're doing mm-hmm. it. And this is pretty early on, and he goes, and I'm like, okay, you know what would what would Kenny say here? And you could bleep this out. He's like, motherfucker. Like, don't go pushing that money button yet. And awesome. why? You know, Kenny's gonna say what we tell him to say. He did not in that exact words, but just like we're creating these stories right. um, uh, for them. Like not that we're creating their life that they can, um, but we, we're we're giving them something to say. It's like don't think about what he'd say because. I never have done that, right. and he's always ended up saying what I kind of want to say. Kevin tells a very similar mm. story. We, uh, my brother-in-law, we did a podcast early on. He was like our fifth or sixth one, and, and he tells a very similar story about going in with Craig. Yeah, and and he's like, he's like, I think we need to write a Kenny Chesney song. And he's like, What the hell are you talking about? I know. <laughs> I how, like, do you, how, how do you how do you do that? Yeah. He's uh, like, yeah. What are you talking about? Rare, so, that's good advice. Rarely do those target rights work right. you know mm-hmm. where you um where you try you're trying too hard to actually mm-hmm. be them and, and yeah and that could actually end up feeling old to them so like to go back to the possibility of it almost like you're making a record for yourself it's like all right i have an artistic drive and, and ability and there are things that you know in some co-writes uh you don't really get to go to like you know uh, yeah. and and because uh, it might be a little outside of it, it the might, genre or, 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 or even whatever. just a little more adventurous or something yeah. whatever like mm-hmm. creative but like I look at it like man if if there's something in me that I haven't been able to get out and there are core rights where I can do it but like uh, if there's something in me that needs to get out on my own that would com- be completely me um, and and whether, wherever I'm drawing the inspiration from, uh, whatever, or wherever I want to go musically, or, or some crazy bridge idea, something, just get so creative. And, you know, to have a lab like this, I need a lab too. That's part of my process is to just, I mean, to just play guitar for nothing. That's where a lot of ideas come from. Right. Or if I'm making new drum samples or I'm mm-hmm. making whatever sounds, it'll inspire something. So I need that. But, like, I've talked to my publishers where we're going to be doing this um, where... I think it's like October, November, December. I have, on purpose, very little co-writes, and I'm yeah. gonna kind of just hole up and see what I come up with, and 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 not from a. So you're just gonna lock up in your beat lab and yeah. see what happens. Huh? Yeah, because it's just yeah. I know there's I there's something like I know there's something that needs to get out, and I just need to do it. But uh, and I think it it also it sharpens your sword when you go back into a co-write, you know, and how yeah. you're gonna. Um, uh, you'll, it'll make you a better co-writer. Well, in the Nashville, mm-hmm. the Nashville uh, way of co-writing and sessions and stuff, well, it, it's it's been created for efficiency, not necessarily what creativity really mm-hmm. requires. And so I think a lot of uh, phenomenal songwriters in this town have tailored their songwriting styles around for those co-writes, but creativity is really difficult to rush. And the fact yeah. that oh, a so great true. song can come out of a three-hour co-write is, is really uh, an attribution... A, a, attributed to how good those songwriters are sure. because the creative process of somebody there i was watching a video the other day taylor swift's new single came out everybody was all in no tour about it yeah. saying how terrible it was i didn't think it was that bad i don't yeah. think the course is great but i really didn't sure. think the singles i thought it was pop taylor swift and yeah. she was trying to be edgy and yeah. whatever but this guy had made this video where he'd like scientifically looked at all these algorithms of what what people like for songwriting. Yeah. There's the, there are certain lines that they like to hit, and none of her song doesn't hit any of those lines. Therefore, mm-hmm. it can't be a great song. And I'm like, how oh. can you quantify <laughs> something that's comp- not only songwriting that's just someone's mind, but something that's completely subjective? Yeah. I'm, this is going to be, I'll, I'll catch some flack for this. I'm not a big fan of the Beatles. I'm just not. I don't think they're bad. I this just, interview's <laughs> over. <laughs> exactly. Does, yeah, does, does, does I still love you. People, I'm just not a huge fan of sure. the Beatles. I so, but I understand that 98% of the world yeah. is. So something that's as subjective as music and art, just looking at a painting, how yeah. can you say, well, that can't be good because it doesn't hit this mark, this mark, and this mark? Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. 
I don't know. I mean, if you're going honest, and I, I don't know if this is going to hurt my career, <laughs> this but is like a safe space. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I I completely uh, get that because I, I had some experiences um, with a certain massive radio company. I won't name any names, but like mm. it was working with an artist uh, on Sony, and um, and we had the head of this radio company come over and. Um, he was telling us about the process of a lot of times how they pick mm -hmm. uh, what's a hit and what's not, mm -hmm. and it's spreadsheets and graphs yeah. and software and and oh, sending. Yeah, the you're song. talking about like uh, Cumulus and all those big mm -hmm. radio stations. You that... are not me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've been on radio tours, but, but I'm Clear Channel. How to set that this up so people they, yeah. can and, understand it? But it's there's there's the they label. All the radio stations. There's yeah, la there's a label, and then there's people at that own all of the stations yeah. that pick the songs that are going to be on the radio. Right. That's where the spreadsheets come. That's in. right. And this <laughs> particular insane. you know this particular situation was like they send a song out to a hundred program directors. And they have like a questionnaire of like, okay, at this point in the song, do you want to change the station? At this point in the song, are you still in it? You know, all this stuff. And they answer like a hundred questions, whatever. Then they compile all that info into their software and a graph pops up. Mm -hmm. right. And they look at that as opposed to And the PDs well, the ears. aren't the audience. I, I mean, know. and I've met a lot of awesome PDs doing yeah. video tours and stuff. But they're not the audience, yeah. and that's the thing that's crazy. And I can say this because I'm not in music industry. It's not gonna, you're not going to come take my. I love every. I love every PD. Clint loves <laughs> right. everyone he's ever met. I and really I, do. That's not saying anything bad about no, them I know. at all. But they're that kind of stuff is like you're confining yourself to these are not the people buying records. They're getting yeah. the records sent to them. Yeah. Like you really want to be talking to the people that are buying the records and seeing yeah. what they like. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah, there, there's another story I'll tell you off. Uh, <laughs> off microphone like that. that is very interesting, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, but yeah, it's it's. I think all that is is inspiring. This this, even if it's three months of just holding myself up because I I I've collected some some titles that I definitely want to write by myself, and I can I can almost hear exactly like I like white gravy. Like I love <laughs> white gravy. <laughs> that is gonna be That's smash. A title. Title track of Clint's next Mashed record. potatoes. <laughs> Smash potatoes. But yeah, <laughs> with white gravy. But it, yeah, mm -hmm. but anyway, so that's kind of where things are right now. So uh, writing with uh, and producing an, an artist, the, the artist that I uh, produced for Sony, uh, Stephen Lee Olson. Mm -hmm. This was before the big regime change at Sony. So unfortunately, a lot of their new artists were yeah, dropped. I was, I was with uh, Josh Dore. Oh, Josh, that's right. He's great. Yeah. yeah, he got let go, and it's like, ah. Oh. My one hunting trip here with Jim Catino, Josh Dore oh, was Josh there. Was yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Pheasant yeah. hunt. Mm -hmm. That was so fun. Um, I still have the pheasant. I don't know how long they're good for in the freezer, but that was a couple of years ago. <laughs> Dude, you should get that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> right on the wall, right over here. It would be perfect. Yeah. They're already, they're already, <laughs> they're already skinned. And yeah, they're, oh, okay, gotcha. They're ready for the grill. But, All right. Um, <laughs> But yeah, they uh, uh, we ended up writing a bunch for the record and producing that record and, and turned it in fully. But one of the last songs we wrote was "Blue Ain't Your Color." Um, Stephen came Slow in. Slow down. Yes. <laughs> bum bum bum. <laughs> Blue Ain't Your Color by Keith Urban. By that just went number one this yes. past year. Yes. That you got a bunch of plaques over here. Congratulations yeah. on that. Thank you. That is Thank amazing. You. That's a, such an amazing song, dude. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And 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 again, it's it's the it's the it's those moments that can look like it's the end of the world that kind of end up being the best thing that could ever happen to you. So that's a song that didn't make Josh's record. Uh, it was Steven. Steven Leo. Yeah, it actually yeah. did. Yeah, we, we cut it for Steven, and, um, and it was on the record. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when Steven... But we got that song at the end, and he right. came in with a title, and we, we started it. And then we're like, you know what? We we need to we need to get in with Hillary Lindsay and like just to get her vibe on this too and um, and you do that on a record like you kind of want to get some you know you want to spread the love in Nashville and mm -hmm. get some co-writes with some cool writers and and we've known Hillary for a long time but we had never written with her uh, but you know in Barlow we we wrote with a ton and mm -hmm. so anyway we get the the right set up and we ended up writing um, from like eleven a.m. to 3 a.m. It was an amazing night. Mm. We ended up writing like seven songs. Hillary's so awesome where she gets, if she gets stuck on one song, I don't know if she does this every time, but she did that night and there was a lot of wine and cigarettes and it was fun. 
Uh, it was a lot of fun. But we, she'd get up if she was stuck and go over to the piano and just start knocking on some chords, and and that would inspire something else. And then we'd like, oh my gosh, this song's cool too. So we'd start writing that one, hmm. and then she'd push pause on that, take the excitement from that, and bring it back to the one we really wanted to finish, which was Blue. Hmm. And we did that a bunch, but we started like seven others that are really cool. We need to finish, but um, wow. so we we finished Blue, we record it. Steven gets dropped. Um, and so now he's at Cornman and uh, his publishing company, and they're like, okay, now we have a record full of songs that we can pitch, mm -hmm. uh, except for one, and that's Blue. And they had this meeting, like, um, Brett James was so adamant about not this one, everyone but this one, because we're going to, Steven's going to do something right. else, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we're going to put this on it. So later that afternoon, uh, Nate Lowry, their plugger, said, screw it. I know Keith's looking and Missy Gallimore just called me for songs. I'm going to apologize later and send her the song. And it was, it was that day that it was on hold. And, um, so yeah, it ended up doing what it did. But at that time when Steven got dropped and then just everything, it was, it was like all that work, like mm -hmm. a, over a year. Of and you produced Steven, show. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you were the whole, man, he's a great artist. Such uh, a nice guy too. He is great. I met him during that radio tour time with Canadian. Where it's the same. Yep. Yeah. It's gotta be nice. Oh yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah. He's such a good dude. And, and so in, in you bond in that, it's like going to summer camp for a year and, mm -hmm. but, and it was in my studio where the clock's not ticking. Like, you know, and I love going to Blackbird and, and stuff like that. You, you, you can be kind of limited by the, budget you see and the dollar time. signs scrolling on yeah the it's like let's hurry up <laughs> so that way we, looks like a dollar sign. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah we were able to you know kind of hone in and really get his sonic signature and really figure that out because that is like i don't produce like writing is my friend butter but i'll produce when um i just like can't not do it i want to yeah. be so in it because it takes so much time and hopefully you can write for it too but I'm not that guy either that you're going to cut all my songs yeah, if there's a better song than mine we're right. cutting that because I want you guys to win but um, uh, so spending all that time and the blood sweat and tears and he was going through some relationship stuff so it was like you know there were couch sessions it was just right. so much like yeah. Yeah. And and then for it to all end, it, you just it really felt like a punch in the gut, and and you don't think anything good's gonna come from it, and then that did, and it doesn't always work that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, but, uh, tie it into this table. I know. Man, that's like yeah. full circle. That's why this table's here. This table's yeah. going nowhere. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. It's a little coffee table that, and you you said you bought saved up bought it for your wife. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. There it is. Uh, and yeah, I, uh, I'm gonna uh, for this uh, little. Uh, hibernation thing I'm going to do for a little bit I'm going to I normally write on my computer uh, but I'm going to write with pen and paper just to just yeah. to just get back yeah. you know and mm -hmm. see if it I, I, I I'm going to have fun I'm just going to make it fun you yeah, know man, even if you get cool. nothing one day you still got something if you're you know whatever you right. know I'll, mm -hmm. I'll jump on the drums I'll whatever I'll do whatever I want well, you, yeah. you work hard and you get to the point where you have whatever level of success you consider yourself, because everybody else can say what they see from the outside, but whatever level of success you feel like you've hit, and you do that so you can be comfortable enough, so you can say, you know, I'm going to take three months and I'm going to write songs just mm -hmm. by myself, and I'm going to work, and I'm going to build tracks, mm -hmm. and if something comes of it, awesome. Yeah, and, and if something and doesn't, I spent three months learning. That's right. Oh. You, that's right. And where you can get in that grind where you're not, like, I... I said this a long time ago but it, it makes sense it's continuing to make sense or there are songs that keep the lights on and then there are songs that keep the fire burning and I was realizing I wasn't writing enough fire songs and too many keep the lights on songs right. and um, and it just it'll drain you and especially if you you come from a background of, of you know eight to ten hours a day you know playing guitar and, and other instruments and recording stuff that that gets in you and and I think something happens where you're just kind of always wanting more than right. you know some things you can do in a yeah, uh, quick, uh, quick 10 to 2 yeah. session yeah, and no, that's session. not saying anything against those it's just um, yeah I think it I'm thankful to be in a place where I kind of do have the luxury right now to, to take this time and oh. if anything it, it will just you know make me a better co-writer and or um i could get a bunch of 
great ideas and tracks started and you know save them for a bus ride with some artist or something you know yeah. right. just build the ammo closet yeah you know absolutely but when you walk into a a, se- a writing session or I have a chorus and a verse yeah yeah <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean you guys finish this I'm gonna sit you over you follow here. the music city I my yeah oh my gosh that, yeah. that whole thing that's like we that needed needs that. to be one it's like when you come into a ride yeah. <laughs> with a chorus and a verse already. that's right like, <laughs> yeah it's yeah. Like, yeah it's like it's that Chewbacca who's uh-huh. like uh-huh. right you know. here's my third <laughs> yeah <laughs> y'all finish no. y'all finishes <laughs> don't mess it up I'll be right no, it is, man. And that's the thing. Like, we get into the grind so much that we don't um, have that opportunity yeah. to bring something like that into a cool co write. Um, if I do see something on my calendar coming up and I got like a week before it, I will take a few days before and just prepare. Because I don't, I mean, you don't want to blow that. If I got a bus ride trip coming up, I'll prepare for that and get some things started. And because you, you want some no brainers, right. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and you get to a point where you just you don't need another song. I got hundreds and hundreds of songs. Mm-hmm. I don't want those anymore. Like I just wanna. Um, and not that I'm gonna write some, you know, Brian Wilson Beach Boys Burt Bacharach <laughs> chord progression thing. But like at least dive into what got you into all this and get just get creative. Whatever it is, like lyrically, melodically, chordally structurally anything just ex- explore mm-hmm. and experiment and um you know and i think that is again if nothing comes out of it something will come out of it the fact that you actually got to take that time and and fill those tanks and you know just get recharged because you know you can get kind of dry yeah uh-huh. and you know become a lot of ones and fives and sixes and fours yeah <laughs> there's so many there's so many mm-hmm. options yeah I, I slowly i i got a little taste of that before i stopped touring and playing so mm-hmm. I can completely understand yeah it's good man I, and I, I I hope something cool comes out of it so that it can be maybe encouraging for someone else to try it if they get to that point uh, to not be scared to do it uh, I mean look at Lori McKenna she's up mm-hmm. in Massachusetts writing you know and, and she's mm-hmm. that's another thing she's writing as an artist she is an artist and you know she had the early Faith Hill stuff that Faith ended up playing her stuff. So I think there is something to it where you do just draw from your experience and your path and your level mu- musically and whatever and just no one else is here to tell me no and all that stuff. But um, yeah, so yeah, that's that's coming up. Man, I think that uh, your drive is, is really inspiring because like, look, from the outside looking in as, as a writer, you think, well, once I get that number one cut, it's just, mm-hmm. everything's going to be gravy at that point oh no but the fact that you you still love it after all these years it really show is a testament that you're doing what you truly love to do mm-hmm. or else you would have been like check got that done yeah let's yeah. go on you know yeah and i think that's just really inspiring for for me you know just to, to see that you're still loving what you do um, there are times I drive, don't honestly you know, I mean drive it's yeah, still a job sometimes yeah. yeah well and there's there's uh, don't get me wrong I, I do dream of some time you know, my dad makes this incredible donut and like how cool <laughs> would it be to just move back to Maine and open this donut shop that just sold one donut by the beach <laughs> right. you know you know because the, the you know the, the here comes goodbye was uh, it's all marked off of my son Eli's age he was born when that happened so oh, wow. eight years um, and not that I'm entitled to having radio hits but mm-hmm. it it is kind of the way the industry is going you really do need to get the single mm-hmm. um to supplement everything else mm-hmm. and uh so you know it's it's a lot of ups and downs uh a lot of uh i mean cuts are great but they're you know as we know they they don't really do much anymore it's cool for your bio and everything but right. mm-hmm. you really need to get that single so it had been you know at that time seven years between here comes goodbye and blue, mm-hmm. and your color, uh, and uh, y- you in those in that in between time, you can definitely get, you know, just frustrated because you know you're. It's not like going to the factory. You put in forty hours, you get paid for forty hours. Oh right, you know. Yeah. Here it's truth. like you put in. I I work. Well, we just took a we took a month off. We went to Maine, um, 
because I, I didn't realize this, but I had worked basically seven days a week for a year and two months, didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. And I was wow. so fried and my wife being so smart and knows what I, you know, know, know what I'm, how I'm wired and what I need a lot of times <laughs> that I don't know. She's like, we're, we're, we're out. We got to go. Yeah. You need this so bad. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so we did it and I got refreshed, but, um, but yeah, you can just work so much and not see the results that you would in a, mm-hmm. you know, so that can kind of burn you out. But the, I think the love and the passion is, is, was born when I was 13. And from that point on, that still is alive and well, like, mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of what's kind of bubbling up again in me now is to take this little hibernation moment. Um, to, not that we can ever go back, you know, like when life revolved around a new chord <laughs> and a new scale. Like, yeah. Um, but you can tap into that and or at least try to find that a little bit just to keep going, uh, you know, through another 500 nose for that <laughs> possible Yes, um, mm-hmm. and you got to do that. But I'm thankful to be able to do that. You know what's coming up. But um, yeah, um, we'll see. If you're doing three months at the end of the year, taking off, you're gonna have plenty of time for whitetail hunting. <gasps> <laughs> Dude, you have set it up perfectly. Boys, September the Boys. 24th is first day of archery season, Come and on. it's see, just gravy. Where? It's it's white gravy from there. Out. <laughs> <laughs> it's white gravy, white tail yeah, gravy. It's, it's white tail gravy. Oh my gosh, that's Blake Shelton's next record. Dude, I mean, you can hunt the morning, nap, and then start recording. Son, the rest of the night. I think Come all on. this is meant to be. That's right. Is. See? <laughs> yeah, yeah, boys. And then that's the thing. Like Barlow, he's every year. He's like, dude, we going hunting. Like he's oh, like, yeah. and I'm like, oh, I'm in the middle of this and this and this. Yeah. And each year, I'm buying like some new gear, some uh-huh. new hunting clothes, and I got a closet full. And I'm looking at him like, it's the thing you have yeah. to make time. For. Like it really is. Like even like people have been doing it as long as we have. Like as hardcore, it, you you have to make the time. Yeah. It, it doesn't just happen. You're like, no. oh, you know, I'm not doing like Saturday morning for four yeah. and a half hours. Yeah, I think I'll go hunting. You have to be like, I'm going Saturday morning for mm-hmm. four and a half hours. Yeah, and it, and it's like I guess it's uh, it's self-inflicting too because I, I work so much and then I have a family too so it's like yeah. if I do get time off it's like I really need to pour yeah. it into my family yep. and I am still like I mean I, I trade sleep for a tough time balance. with the fam so like yeah. so then when it's like okay hunting this weekend getting up at three uh, all right exactly. or sleeping you know like, it's ah. a tough balance for sure especially once you have kids That's, mm-hmm. I didn't realize how hard it was going to be but it got much I remember when I was like 18 I'd hunt five times a week and yeah just go but then yeah. after i got married i've got three kids now and it's just like mm-hmm. you really do have to but that's another reason you have to plan it out so much i yeah. went deer hunting once last year because i just wow. didn't do well i broke my ankle in september to be fair okay so i wasn't able to hunt until like the beginning of november but he, I was, just, he was still hobbling around he hunting. <laughs> <laughs> but i just didn't do a good job of like saying you know what two saturdays from now or whatever yeah you know? so yeah so like the sunday with the dove hunt I do, I can, do, <laughs> I can do it. It'll make next week crazy, but I got, I'm gonna do it. All right, are you doing I'm it? Gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll get him on tape. Yeah, good. See, uh, that's how you sell it to the wife. Dude. Well, no, I don't. She's like, she's actually go, go. You need oh, to go. Oh, she's done, dude. Time. I know. I mean, it's it's and really relaxing. And then you can relaxing. you don't even have to bring yeah. a lab. They can go out and get your birds for you. It's perfect. Dude, <laughs> <laughs> we need a couple retrievers. I don't think anybody's bringing a dog. Right? <laughs> yeah. We'll yeah. bring Eli. I think a couple people are bringing their kids. Yeah, man, that'd be great. But yeah, I, I got to do it. Like as yeah. much as I can. It's fun. Well, the know. dove hunting, especially, it's just a it's a good time. We've talked about it a billion times. And it's just like it's I've never a, been. Oh it's man, a you're super sitting around chill a field, you're yelling, you're like we barbecue, we fish, we shoot over. skeet. We, it's oh. super laid back. It's just a fun day of like just a bunch of dudes just hanging out. There'll probably be people there you know. A bunch of people are coming, so cool. I'm sure there'll be yeah. people that you know there. So twelve gauge. Yeah, well, actually, I shoot 20. 20. Gauge. You shoot 20? I, I moved down to a 20 I, I a couple years 12. ago because oh. my shoulder started getting black and blue because I like to shoot a lot. <laughs> what do y'all, like, what, like, a, was, I'm sure there's probably a dove load. There yeah, are, yeah. There's, there's some, like, yeah. heavy, Remington sells a heavy dove load. I think it's a Winchester seven sells shot. Winchester a small Number game. Seven. Yeah, mm-hmm. anything from, like, sixes yeah. to eights. I shoot okay. a seven yeah. and a half. Cool. I just bought a, a case of shells yesterday, so. Sweet. Yeah, it's fun. And then, but we'll shoot, like, 
we'll shoot skeet that morning so everybody can kind of get because yeah. i don't shoot all year yeah for skeet or anything so yeah. we'll we'll shoot a few rounds of skeets everybody can kind of get warmed up and mm-hmm. then you'll miss a bunch of birds everybody's mm-hmm. gonna miss a bunch of birds mm-hmm. that's just the way it is yep. they're like little they're the 30, fastest they're, they're faster than ducks oh, yeah. they're yeah. like little 35 mile like, an hour oh, rockets oh, that are just big around yeah. you're trying to that's hit. a lot of fun yeah. but that's it is great fun. so i mean just to get uh a little coaching here before we do this so like um are there's some like a dog going up to scare them up out of yeah, the field or in they, the tree. They fly over. Yeah. So, so we planted. Yeah. Yeah. We oh, planted. Yeah. We planted a four-acre field this year. Okay. That was just we just planted it for doves. Okay. And so it's it's ready to go. Sunflowers. Hopefully millet. this it's, yeah. it's wheat this year. So oh, okay. hopefully the hopefully the rain has not pushed the birds out. But we had fifty or hundred in midday hanging out, which means in the evenings it should be quite a few more. All right. So, um, but yeah, you're sitting on the edge of a field. Yeah. And they come in waves, so mm-hmm. like you'll be sitting. And then all somebody will see bird, and you'll look up, find it in the field, and yeah. if it comes close to you, take a shot. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden, there'll be one coming from this way, and one from over your head, and one from across the field. And then for ten minutes, nothing will happen. Yeah. They like it's. Yeah. Somehow they can come from opposite ends of the field. Sure. But for some reason, they all come at once. Okay. And like an They're hour before bombing in. Yeah. An hour really before like, dark, yeah. if the hunt is as good as it has been before, it's constant. Oh, like everybody's around the field constantly. See, every, the thing is, I don't even care seconds. if I shoot anything except for skeet. Like, I mean, like, yeah. just to be out there. Well, there's a big yeah. lake, so we fish yeah. for bass and catfish. Dude, yeah, yeah I got to do this. A, a couple fun. people bring their four wheelers. Like, mm-hmm. it'll be fun. We have a yeah. time. It's like 15 or 20 guys. Cool. Both people from, like, just friends from construction, and then there's a bunch of music guys. And okay. Mm-hmm. It's cool. So, we it's all, like, is there, uh, I think you might have sent the address. I can't remember. We all I just kind of meet in there. Yeah, we'll meet there. And if, like, you want to, I think Carrie's gone. Yeah, Carrie. Carry. I talked to him this but like, morning. like I've got I'm leaving I'm leaving at uh at um ass crack early to uh sorry I'm I'm leaving at the break of dawn to go do some bobcat work so I think Oh up there you're Oh you're going to yeah. run and run so I'm leaving yeah. at like 5 o'clock in the morning and haul uh, bobcat so. Oh man Yeah I <laughs> you don't want to ride with me uh, <laughs> I might, we might be able to ride together because I'm not sure who's all coming. Brian White's coming. Okay. I, I hunt with Brian yeah. and uh, he's bringing his kids, so he'll probably drive separate. Cool. But we can maybe ride together. Yeah, I don't mind driving either, but yeah, yeah. I, I'll let, uh, yeah. It, it's a good fun. time. And, but. and, and it is a uh, choke, you got to put a choke in. Yeah, yeah modified or improved. Okay, yeah. cool. I have those. Yeah. A full okay. choke's too tight, you'll never hit anything unless you're just awesome. Mm-hmm. And it's modified is usually what the gun comes with. Yeah. You know, yeah. most of the time. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, one of those two. I think I shoot improved usually, but yeah. And what, three rounds? You can't yeah, have more than three? Yeah, you have a plug in your gun, you yeah. can only hold three rounds. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of what it is. I'm bringing is. a, uh, I just bought a little home defender. I'm going to try it out. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's going to try to hip shoot one. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> if you can hip shoot a dove, I'll give you $20. <laughs> All right. Hey. <laughs> Deal. Of course, the pattern on that thing is probably like this big. Right, yeah. Like, I'll yeah. Shoot a shot. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. you guys on the other side of the field. Yeah, exactly. like that. <laughs> yeah, and we'll have a safety briefing before the hunt. Oh, yeah. I did get shot at. Oh, years no. ago by he did. He felt some pellets. Yeah, I, I was that's there the first there. time it had ever happened. Happened. So we'll yeah. have a safety briefing. Before, yeah, when so. you see somebody swinging a gun around hip level, they mm-hmm. they have not gone to the, the hunter safety course. <laughs> no, oh, they're, boy. they're just yeah. you can tell it's wild. You can tell a body language. Yeah, uh, someone does not has not held a gun before. Yeah, I'm and, gonna be far away from them boys. Uh, you, yeah. I mean, I've seen people like jump. You know, oh, yeah. Whoa, what oh, do you yeah. do? You know, and my brother-in-law. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, you know, they're just swinging around hip yeah. level, and you're like, uh-huh. what are you doing, dude? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what, um, I know you got to go. Clint, yes, where's sir. the best place for people to find you online, if you even want them to follow you online? It's just Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. It's just my name, Clint Lagerberg. Gotcha. Yeah. I don't have a website. And look for the uh, single, uh, I Love White Gravy on iTunes coming February. Or Whitetail Gravy. Or no, Whitetail white Gravy. gravy. Blake yes. Shelton. You, got, you can't steal that title. No, though. wait, this is us. We're going to write <laughs> yeah, this together. Hey, it's it's a right, right here. There you go. Oh, yeah, <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, you got anything else? I don't think so, man. That's, uh, I'll, I'll say it again, though, man. Just thank you for sitting down with us. And listing you is really inspiring to me. To, like, oh, thank I'll, you, dude. You know, the, the drive and the... The rise to success and during those down times how it just made all of that so much sweeter mm-hmm. and uh to keep keep on keeping on is just uh, man that that's inspiring thank so you dude thanks for sitting down with us today we really appreciate my it my pleasure thanks for having <laughs> us. 
and we're going to get out this season and, oh. and shoot at some deer at least. Yeah. You know, <laughs> what is so weird to me is I actually didn't even think that. All I could think of was like, I'm going to have this time to actually get into this super creative mode, but yeah. damn, it's, hey, it's right around. Right here. There's, there's, music, there's oh. no better way to come into a right than out of a deer stand. Oh, <laughs> son. <laughs> it's, yeah, mm-hmm. this is going to be good. All right. Well, <laughs> thanks for listening, guys, and until next week. Come on, buddy. Yeah, come on, buddy. Come on. Come on. Good. White tail gravy. <laughs> <laughs> the title of this podcast, White Tail Gravy. All right. Okay.